one of these, this one, is always a little bit smaller than the other, that's okay. I just make sure that I get to keep this loaf and give that one away. Today, we're gonna focus on baking one of my most popular and I think easiest recipes I've ever published on my website. I've had it up for a number of years now. It has over 3,000 comments and it's for my beginner sourdough bread. I think it's really suitable for a beginning baker all the way up to a seasoned or experienced baker. It's just an easy and flexible recipe that results in two amazingly beautiful and I think super delicious loaves of bread. You'll find you'll probably wanna bake almost every week in your home kitchen. And what's so beautiful about this recipe is that there are only really three ingredients. You've got flour, water, and salt. So with three ingredients, we're kind of magically transforming these things into an amazing loaf of bread. And that's really part of one of the reasons why I love sourdough bread, because you don't need a lot. You can just mix these things together give it time to ferment and you get this amazing loaf of bread in the end. So we're gonna mix together white bread flour, whole wheat flour, and rye flour. So this is kind of like the trinity of flours that I love using in a lot of my baking. Rye flour isn't something that you might see very often in kind of a country loaf or, or your, your typical table bread. I love adding in a small percentage. I use 5% in this recipe, so it's not very much. But what it does bring, I think, is it brings an extra level of flavor to the bread, of course, but it also adds a little bit of color to the crust. So you get a beautiful kind of burnished color that comes through. It also kind of aids in fermentation. And then I add in a little bit of whole wheat flour. This is really for just a little bit of added nutrition and of course, for more flavor. If you don't have whole wheat flour, you can just swap that out for more white flour. And if you don't have the rye flour, you can swap that out for more whole wheat. And if you don't have rye or whole wheat, then just make it all white flour. Just use whatever you have in your pantry if you have another whole grain flour like spelt, swap it in for the whole wheat. So you get the idea. It's really flexible. It's really kind of adaptable to whatever you have in your kitchen. Let's look at the schedule for making this sourdough bread. Instead of doing an overnight Levon, I'm doing a five hour Levon. So I usually mix that in the morning around eight or 9 a.m. and I let that ripen for five hours. And then the second step in this recipe is to do an auto lease. So we let that sit for an hour while our Levon is continuing to ripen. Once our Levon is ripe and we're ready to mix, we'll do mixing all in a mixing bowl by hand. After that quick hand mix, we'll do a bulk fermentation or the dough's first rise. It's a little bit longer than I typically go at four hours. And I find that gives this dough really a good head start in that first fermentation to set it up for a successful final proof in the refrigerator overnight. During that bulk fermentation, we're going to give the dough several sets of stretches and folds that's gonna add strength to the dough and it means that we can do less mixing by hand up front. Then we'll divide, pre-shape, and shape the dough. And then we will put that shaped dough in its basket in the fridge overnight and let it finish proofing. The dough should be ready to go straight away into the oven. And you can bake that in the morning when you first wake up, or you can wait till later in the day and bake it kind of in the afternoon or even in the evening if you want fresh bread for dinner. So again, flexible schedule, flexible recipe, and now we're ready to get into the first step. Our Levon is our pre-ferment. When your sourdough starter is ripe in the morning, it's usually when you would give it a feeding. We're gonna mix this together. So to that jar, add 38 grams of your ripe sourdough starter, 38 grams of whole wheat flour, 38 grams of your white bread flour, and then 76 grams of water. Mix all those ingredients together in your jar, loosely put the cover on top, and then we'll give it a good five hours to ferment at warm room temperature. For the second step, what we're gonna do is we're gonna mix together only the flour and most of the water in the recipe. And we're gonna do that an hour before our Levon is scheduled to be ready and put into our main mix. So this auto lease really just helps kind of reduce the mixing time that we're gonna to need to do by hand which is kind of great and in line with the ethos of this recipe of just being kind of a simple and beginner recipe. In addition, I find that since we're using a large portion of white bread flour, the auto lease really helps to kind of get a lot of extensibility in that dough. The dough is able to expand more and fill with gases during the time of fermentation, you know, bulk and proof, but also while baking in the oven. 
add 773 grams of our white bread flour, 114 grams of our whole wheat flour, 51 grams of our whole rye flour, and then 603 grams of water. That 50 grams that we hold back will be what we use to help mix the salt and the ripe Levon into the recipe. After an hour, we'll come back and we'll add the Levon, the salt, and do our proper final dough mix. Okay, we're back. It's been an hour. The dough is rested. And now we're gonna do step three of the recipe, which is the actual mixing of our final dough. We have two more ingredients to add. We have our fine sea salt in our Levon. Our Levon is nice and ripe. It's really bubbly on top has a nice kind of sour aroma to it. If you recall, we also held back about 50 grams of the water during mixing. That'll help us work the salt and the Levon into the dough during mixing. One important thing to keep in mind with sourdough fermentation and really just kind of any fermentation is the temperature. So I've been monitoring the temperature of my water and kind of my kitchen to make sure that this dough ends up around 76 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty warm, so if it's cool in your kitchen, you might wanna warm your mixing water to a little bit over 78 degrees. I would probably go to maybe 80 or 82 degrees. That'll help keep things a little bit warmer so that our dough at the end of mixing gets to around 76 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Take the temperature of the dough at this point to see where the temperature is. If it's cool, warm that mixing water that we have held back. I like to sprinkle the sea salt just kind of on top. And then grab your ripe Levon and scoop the Levon out onto the dough. We have about 190 grams. We'll use that reserved water to help mix everything together. So you can wet your hand with the water, pour some on top to help the salt dissolve, and then maybe hold back a little bit more, start mixing and see how the dough feels. If the dough is really wet and very sloppy, then don't add the rest of the water. If it feels like it can take it and it's still kind of cohesive and strong, then you can add the remaining water in the recipe. We always kind of need to be sensitive to how much water we're adding because every bag of flour is different, every environment's different. When you're mixing these ingredients in there, it helps to just pinch, pinch from one side to the other. And then I like to fold the dough over and then pinch again from one side to the other. Okay, I've been mixing the dough in this bowl for a few minutes. This dough is not smooth, it's pretty shaggy, and almost no gluten development at this point. That's okay, we're gonna strengthen this dough through sets of stretches and folds during bulk fermentation. You'll see how this dough really transforms during bulk fermentation. It goes from this shaggy, kind of gloopy mess to a super smooth and aerated dough over the next four hours. I have a ceramic bowl that I use to keep my dough in during the first rise. And you can use any container you have in your kitchen, really a square glass container, a rectangular glass container works really well. Or if you want to, and you have a large mixing bowl like this, you can just leave the dough in the mixing bowl. We're gonna take the temperature of the dough. So I want this dough to be around 76 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Mine's a little bit on the cooler side at 77 degrees, which is, I think, just fine. If your dough is a little bit cooler than that, just expect to know that you're gonna to need to extend bulk fermentation a little bit past the four hours that I'm gonna do here today. Be flexible with bulk. I'll show you the signs to look for when we're at the end and we need to divide. We'll set a timer for 30 minutes. We'll come back and give it its first of three sets of stretches and folds. Okay, it's been 30 minutes in bulk fermentation and we're gonna give the dough its first set of stretches and folds. I like to have a bowl of water next to my dough and I'll use this to dip my hands into. And just reach down one side of the dough and lift it up and stretch and fold it over to the other side. Then rotate the bowl 180 degrees. Do the same thing on the other side. Kind of a minimal mix with this dough, so we're being a little bit more strong and vigorous with it here. Set a timer for 30 minutes and we'll give it another set. Okay, it's been 30 minutes since the first set of stretches and folds, so now we're a full hour 
into bulk fermentation out of the four hours that is needed. And we're gonna do the same exact thing we did for the first set. We're just gonna wet our hands and stretch and fold the dough on each of the four kind of sides of the dough, if you will. After you give it your four stretches and folds, cover the dough and set another timer for 30 minutes. Okay, here we are in the last set of stretches and folds. And we're gonna do the exact same thing we've done for the two previous sets. After we give it those stretches and folds, and we'll just cover the dough again and let it rest until the full four hours of bulk fermentation. It's been four hours. Now it's time for us to actually get this dough divided, get it pre-shaped and then shaped. As you can see, it's risen up almost to the rim of the bowl. It's super smooth on top, and you can see that there's defined edges on top of the dough, kind of where it meets the side of the, the bowl or the bulk fermentation container billowy, kind of jiggling in the bowl, more elastic and stronger, and just airy and kind of alive. To divide this dough, I'm gonna use my bowl scraper to scrape the dough out, my bench scraper to divide the dough directly in half since we're making two loaves, and then I have my small bowl of water nearby that I'll use to wet my free hand. Divide this dough directly in half. I'm just going to I'm going to gently get the dough into form. The second piece is always a little bit more tricky to, to pre-shape because it's kind of, for some reason, always in this strange shape. So I like to push this far end in and then start with the point here on the other end and just quickly get it into kind of a gathered round shape. We'll let them rest for about 30 minutes. Then we'll come back here and we will shape these into their final, final form. A lot of people often ask, should I cover the dough at this state? And I don't actually like to cover that. I just keep it uncovered during the bench rest. If you have a significant draft in your kitchen or an air conditioner that's you know close by the dough, you might wanna put an inverted bowl over the top of each of these. It's been a little over 30 minutes. So I waited a good 35 minutes until this dough is relaxed out a little bit more. I think I pre-shaped it a little bit tighter, so I needed just a little bit more time. If the dough is still really tight after pre-shaping, give it a little time to relax out. I'm using these eight inch round baskets. These are perfect for a round or bowl shape. What I do is I just get a some white flour and a sieve and just kind of sift on some white flour. This helps the dough remove cleanly in the morning when we'll bake it. Dust the dough with some flour. So I'm just gonna grab points on the dough and just kind of fold them up over into each other until you've got this nice round shape. I'll flip the dough over and then I'll use two hands to kind of drag and tuck the dough in to itself and kind of encourage that round shape to form. You can see there's lots of bubbles here, really good fermentation. I'm just gonna pat these out so we don't get any in the end loaf. Scoop up the dough and just drop it right into your basket. For this one, I'll show you my other bowl shaping method. What I like to do is just fold the bottom up to the middle, grab the sides, Fold them in like this, grab the top down to about the middle, and then you can flip all the dough over. Same as the first one, we're just gonna kinda round the dough. Both doughs ready for the fridge. We'll cover these. The reason we do that is because we don't want a dry skin to form on the top of the dough. The same reusable cover that you use for your bulk fermentation container. So cover it up, put it in the fridge, and we'll see you in the morning when we bake these. All right, here we are, day two, and my dough has rested overnight in the refrigerator for probably about 14 hours. Risen, it's up to about the rim. If yours hasn't risen a lot in the fridge overnight, don't worry about that, that's okay. It should still be ready to bake. If you poke the dough, it should feel pretty airy and 
Because the dough is cold, you should still see some spring back, but the dough will still feel pretty tight. That cold kind of elastic dough will not spring back as readily as it would if it was proofing on the counter. If you're worried if the dough feels really dense and not airy at all, you can let it sit out on the counter for 30 minutes, let it come up to room temp to continue to ferment. I've had my oven preheating at 450 degrees Fahrenheit for about 30 minutes. I have my Dutch oven inside. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lay a piece of parchment paper on top of a pizza peel, and then I'm gonna put that inverted on top of my dough in its proofing container. Then I'm gonna flip the whole thing over and my dough will be ready to score on top. And then I'll use the parchment paper to drag that dough right into the preheated and hot Dutch oven. So this way I don't have to turn the dough right into the Dutch oven, which is super hot and it's really hard to handle. This way I can drag it right in on the parchment paper. Once I get it transferred in the Dutch oven, I'll put it into the oven and cover it let it bake with steam for 20 minutes. So the steam is gonna come out of the dough, get trapped, and continue to kind of provide the perfect environment for the dough to fully rise and get the maximal volume. After 20 minutes, we'll take the lid off of the Dutch oven and then let the bread continue to bake in there for about 30 minutes. The other piece of dough is still in the refrigerator covered, waiting for this first one to be finished. I'll repeat the same process for that second piece of dough, and then when they're both finished baking, I'll let them cool on a wire rack for two to three hours until they're fully cool. If you cut the bread too early, then yes, you have a nice warm loaf of bread, which is appealing in, in a certain way, but really I find that if you let the loaf fully cool, you'll get maximal flavor and really the best texture. You won't have any gumminess on the inside. All right, we're done with my beginner sourdough and you should have two loaves of fresh bread. I love this recipe because the crust is super well colored. It's really crunchy, really crusty, and the interior is nice and light. It's super tender. And this is just a really good recipe to start with if you've never baked sourdough bread before. And if you have, I think it's a really nice back pocket recipe that you can use really anytime that you wanna make a simple loaf of bread that's nourishing and super delicious. Hope you give this one a try if you haven't, and I'll see you in the next one. Happy baking.